our next speaker, which is uh, Professor David Avnir. He'll tell us about chirality indicators for extraterrestrial life. Please, David. Yes, so uh, let me start first of all with the uh, motivation for this, uh, for this uh, topic. And uh, uh, I'll do it very briefly because uh, most of you are familiar with these uh, motivations. So first of all, uh, we are in the middle of the exoplanet uh, planets uh, revolution. Uh, in my mind, uh, perhaps the most uh, important revolution since the time that Galileo uh, uh, aligned his uh, telescope to uh, uh, Jupiter. Uh, now that we have more than 4,000 uh, planets, many of them Earth-like, uh, suddenly the prospect of um, extraterrestrial life is not, uh, is not science fiction anymore. Uh, and the second one is the uh, um, massive detection of liquid water uh, everywhere, and not only in the solar system, for instance, in, in Mars in the, in, the, in the past, in this uh, delta remnant um, uh, uh, present in the uh, South Pole, uh, 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 in, in, in the solar system moons, and even in exoplanets, as we have uh, uh, heard before, uh, a detection of, a, of a definitely uh, a absorption line a, of water. So, uh, therefore, uh, it is high time for a re-evaluation of the detection tools of a life, and the key biomarker for, from that point of view on which I'm going to talk is a chirality. And uh, we have only one example, so based on the planet Earth, Chiral characteristics of life are three. First of all, most biomolecules are chiral. Here's a, 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 a scheme. Quite often, two enantiomers occupy the biosphere in unequal amounts. The most celebrated examples are the amino acids and the sugars. And three, this enantiomeric imbalance uh, can be grouped into isostructural homochiral uh, families, and I'll just make a brief com comment about homochirality later on. Um, limiting ourselves to uh, uh, carbon-based uh, water uh, life only, we shall ask which of these char three characteristics can be regarded as a universal indicator of possible life beyond planet Earth. Let me start, first of all, uh, with the uh, universal origin of uh, uh, chirality. And uh, we have, first of all, to remember that it is more likely to form chiral molecule compared with achiral ones as molecular complexity grows. That is, chirality is not such an exceptional molecular feature. And the reason is the following. Achiral molecules must have uh, symmetry, improper rotation symmetry, reflection, inversion, S4, SN, and so on. And that on a molecular structure is a very restrictive uh, limitation. So here we have a, a few examples of achiral molecules. For a molecule to be achiral, you need to have these reflection uh, mirrors. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you start from prebiotic small molecules like this one, none of them is chiral, and you begin to increase complexity and to build the larger and larger molecules, then because of the limitation of having a mirror symmetry to, in order to uh, obtain a chirality, becomes very, very difficult to, uh, to obtain. And uh, here you have a, a, a classical example of two molecules which are complex and therefore uh, chiral. What can we, say, can we say about the ratio between the two enantiomers of molecules, of chiral molecules that are formed because of the increase in, uh, uh, in uh, complexity? There are two cases. The first one is well, from, well known to all of you, and that is that if you form a chiral molecule, you get a racemic mixture of the two enantiomers. Here's a quick example the uh, formation of glyceraldehyde. Glyceraldehyde is the very definition of what is D and what is L uh, from uh, in, uh, interstellar uh, 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 space. 
Uh, but I would like to share a few slides on the second case, which is less known and less familiar, and that is randomness as a source of chirality. If you look at that tree, that tree is, of course, chiral because it doesn't have a reflection mirror and it is not superimposable with its uh, mirror uh, image. We should call it incidental chirality. Here is another example, and this is a folded polymer, polydimethyl siloxane, but any folded uh, polymer. And what is uh, special about the uh, incidental chirality that unlike the small molecules that we have just seen, there is no counter enantiomer. This is a single event with the enantiomer has no chance of, of being formed and, uh, uh, and, it, and it's unique. What is the relevance uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, our topic? Uh, these are the tholins. The tholins, which are large molecules, and these are of incidental chirality, not of inherent chirality. Uh, these are found um, uh, on Pluto and on, on some uh, uh, solar moons, especially on Titan, and they are formed uh, by photochemical processes. By the way, uh, just uh, to mention that the concept of uh, tholins, which means mud, was coined by Carl Sagan. And how do these uh, molecules look like? So uh, a, a lot of work was done by uh, Sun Kwok, and I just copied two, two, two figures from his uh, papers to show you the complexity, and this is incidental chirality. That molecule will appear only once on the planet or only once uh, on the solar moon. Here's another uh, uh, example of that. And so, uh, the tholins are of incidental chirality with no left-right preference of chiral centers, and each large tholin molecule is unique. It appears only once. Enter bioevolutionary processes, and the whole picture changes completely. And it changes from three point of, points of view. First of all, chirality is not incidental and not a unique event, even for very, very large molecules. Here is just uh, one typical of many, uh, nicin, which is a natural antibacterial peptide used as food preservative. Unlike the tholins, this molecule is produced in exactly the same structure in an Avogadro number of, of, of uh, 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 times. The second thing that uh, makes it uh, unique is that the increase in complexity leads to a very large library of chiral molecules. And what is interesting, and this is an elusive feature, it's difficult to, uh, to quantify, that you can identify in that library a time-evolved sequence, some relatedness and some connectedness. So if you find on, the, on, 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 on a planet uh, a surface citrate and uh, malate and fumarate and succinate all in the same location, that is some indirect uh, indication that probably some life forming cycle. The Pilgerhaus? Shalom, shalom. And the third. Shalom, Shir. And the third uh, uh, special feature is that the enantiomeric imbalance is a central feature of life. And so if uh, perseverance will send the following message, hi, I found glycine with 22% enantiomeric excess. What does it mean? How should we interpret that uh, specific, specific value? So uh, let us now talk about the enantiomeric imbalance as a potential life uh, indicator. First of all, an opening uh, statement, life on planet Earth is not homochiral. Um, this is well known to many, but also a paradigm to many others. Uh, uh, here is just an introductory example. This is gramacidine, and you can find in that molecule divaline and elvaline and divaline and telosine and telosine and so on. I've recently pu published a uh, extensive review, which is down here in New Astron Astronomy Review, and the whole question of existence or not existence of homochirality on planet Earth is uh, a, a reviewed along with many other uh, features. Why is that important? Because high enantiomeric excess is a game changer over life existing in a single-handed form which is the current uh, paradigm. 
because if this is true, that and then any enantiomeric excess should be uh, considered as a potential indicator of life. Um, so if we detect a certain specific value of an antiomeric excess on planet Mars or any, any other place, what might affect it? Here are five uh, parameters which affect it. First of all, there is an enrichment of EE of an antiomeric excess by spontaneous derosomization. It's well known in chemistry. You can do it with molecules, with crystals, with interfaces. Uh, it's a, a, for solids, it's called the uh, oswald widmer ripening, which is known for silicates. And uh, why is it uh, interesting that it is known for silicates? Simply because some of the silicates in the, in the Murchison meteorite are the chiral uh, uh, silicates like this uh, Akimotit, uh, but this is a different, uh, uh, different topic. So this is parameter one. Parameter two is that an, an antiomeric excess can be driven by ex external chiral events. Uh, this is a well-known uh, chi chi chiral force that does it. Irradiation with circularly polarized light can cause a distinction between uh, the uh, two enantiomers of a racemic mixture, giving access to one of them over the other. And why is that important? Because, and we shall come to it later again, uh, many of the amino acids found in the Murchison meteorite and, other, meteorite and others reveal clear N excess, and I'll come to that later on, which currently is attributed to external chiral field. One of the uh, examples, a very uh, celebrated example, is isovaline, uh, and I'll come to isovaline also again. And there are lo a lot of interstellar, stellar, circularly polarized light events, such as the recent detected afterglow of a gamma ray uh, uh, burst, uh, which is uh, cited uh, down here. The third uh, parameter which may affect the uh, detected enantiomeric excess is local enrichment due to enantiomeric local location heterogeneity. On planet Earth, for instance, we have these two enantiomers. Uh, the uh, right-handed uh, enantiomer uh, is spearmint. The left-handed enantiomer is, uh, is uh, uh, a caraway. Both are a carbon. And so it depends. If you are near a plant of a spearmint, you will have a very high enantiomeric axis of that one. If you are in another geographical location, where you have a forest of, 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 of that, uh, of the, of that uh, 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 plant, then you will see something uh, interesting, uh, different. That is, an atomeric excess may be also a, uh, a issue of location and of heterogeneity uh, on, the, uh, on the planet. Now, we must consider also the situation of low or medium enantiomeric excess due, due to life forms which use both enantiomers. So I already mentioned that on planet Earth we have it. I'll skip that because of uh, lack, lack of time. There are many, many examples. Uh, here's an example of isovaline, uh, right and left-handed. But uh, uh, that situation can, of course, ha happen also elsewhere. Under what conditions? For instance, if the uh, a life on that remote planet is an embryonic life, unclear enantiomeric excess pattern may characterize a planet that is doing its first embryonic steps in an in attempt to establish life. Testing both enantiomers. Testing and tasting are very uh, similar, so we immediately recall the uh, a problem of uh, Alice of distinguishing between uh, milk sugar and looking glass milk sugar. That's, a, that's exactly the problem of embryonic life, to decide whether to go to this direction or that direction. And the EE uh, situation is uh, vague. Also, we uh, and this is a little bit of science fiction, um, or, 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 I would say speculative, that we have parallel life systems. A two parallel biospheres based on opposite of an antiomer, opposite set of enantiomers of some relative different abundances or either totally transparent to each other or with some mutual uh, interchange, interchange. Of course, this is quite speculative, but anyway, if it does happen, then you should, of course, 
worry about what, what do you do when you encounter your own enantiomer in such a planet which contains the two, uh, uh, the two biospheres uh, completely transparent. Five and minutes. The, okay. And the uh, uh, last, uh, the, the final uh, parameter that uh, dictates the enantiomeric uh, excess is racemization. Racemization can kill and mask initially high enantiomeric excess uh, scenarios and uh, a, 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 a aspartic acid, for instance, uh, a racemizes on a, a, with a half-life of 10 to the fourth years. Isovalin that was found in Merchison barely isomerizes, and this is probably one of the reasons that the L is detected and that we have an antimeric in, imbalance in that, uh, uh, in that uh, place. If this is the case, then quantifying the degree of homochirality is something that people have not thought about. Um, very briefly, uh, you can find it in the review that I uh, mentioned uh, before. Um, I'm proposing a certain uh, way to do it. And uh, um, uh, I, I will leave you to, uh, to, to look at the paper simply because of time shortage and uh, um, move to the summary of the five minutes that I'm left. So, uh, first of all, the probability that we look at life increases with an increase in the following parameter. Increase in the richness of the library of detecting organic molecules, chiral or not. Increase in the complexity of that library, including non-carbon heteroatoms, complexity which shows signs of being non-random, and this is difficult, this is difficult. Increase in the proportion of chiral molecules in that library. Increase in the enantiomeric excess of individual detected molecules. Increase in the global enantiomeric excess of that library. Increase in the ability to group homochiral families into that, in that library. And finally, an increase in the planet-wide abundance of the same molecular pattern. And I'll finish with a risky conclusion, risky conclusions. So when you, uh, to me, the most amazing current observation, which is related to, uh, uh, to evolution of uh, life and to astrobiology is the fact that amino acids in Murchison and other meteorites show clear, all of them show clear L excess. This table is taken from a recent uh, report, but there are many uh, papers. So you can see that L over D here, L over D here, all these well-known amino acids, a very, very clear preference of L. So here are the risky conclusions. An antiomeric excess of L amino acids is universal for the solar system, which means that if you find something on planet Mars, I predict that it will be L amino excess. Second, there is nothing special about amino acids from that, for that to happen. An antiomeric excess should be observed for all other chiral mo molecules of biological origin. For instance, the sugars which predate the amino acids. And this leads us to the three final uh, uh, questions. Has early Earth been seeded with that excess of L amino acids? Are there in the galaxy and antimary excesses of both types, L and D in different locations, which means different polarizations of local bursts, or is the universality of the L excess galaxy, galaxy-wide, is the universality of the L excess galaxy-wide? If this is true, then a symmetry of nature probably enters perhaps the weak force. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question. So years ago, I, um, I was interested in a meteorite called Almahata Sita. It's a meteorite that has a very large excess in L amino acids. And it's, uh, I'm just curious if you know the answer to this, because it's very strange. It's a urolite. It forms very high temperatures, something like uh, 1300 degrees or so Kelvin. So it's much more than the temperature of racemization or even uh, the composition of amino acids. So, is it known today why even it has this L, like this excess in L amino acids? You know, when you try to uh, burn an organic molecule, 
it takes time. If that organic molecule, now uh, when a meteorite is falling through uh, Earth, the outer surface becomes glassy. And the, gla the glassy uh, the protection uh, is an isolating material. So it is not inconceivable that in the inner core of that meteorite, uh, simply the few seconds that it takes uh, to pass the atmosphere um, are too short to reach that, uh, that situation. Another possibility, it's interesting that you mentioned it because the, a previous lecture mentioned uh, a salts of magnesium. Magnesium uh, or uh, salts of amino acids are much more stable than the amino acids themselves. And if the amino acids originally in the meteorites are sodium salts or magnesium salts or calcium salts, then it adds also to the stability. But this is a very new idea, which is due to the conference of today. Thank you very much. Uh, we have to go on, but uh, I'm sure there are more questions. You may do them by email to the speaker.